Buenos Aires World from the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. I'm Marco Wint. And I'm Rick Schwartz. And we're your hosts for Season 3 of Amazing Wildlife, a show from iHeartRadio Ruby Studio and the global conservation organization behind the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. Listen as we dive into the efforts here in San Diego and spotlight the heroes working worldwide to care for the species you know and love. Listen to Amazing Wildlife on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. A science story, huh? And I just thought, well, I figured it, out. it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week's story is from Sean Carroll. It was recorded in April 2015 at Oberon in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as part of the Cambridge Science Festival. It all started when I got a phone call from Stephen Hawking. This was uh, 1992. I was a graduate student at Harvard, just up the street, and Stephen Hawking wanted to offer me a job a postdoctoral job. So you can imagine this is a big deal. We're here celebrating gravity and 100 years of general relativity, and Stephen Hawking has done more to help us understand how gravity works than any person since Albert Einstein, essentially. So, uh, and it's also true that you would like to think that young scientists are all about solving the mysteries of the universe, but from tonight's stories, you figure out really young scientists are all about getting jobs, and then, you know, the, the secrets of the universe will hopefully follow. So the good news is Stephen Hawking wants to offer me a job. The bad news is I was not in the office when the phone rang. It was my office mate, Brian, who actually answered the phone and he got the call. And it really is Stephen Hawking. It's, you hear Stephen Hawking's voice when he calls you and then he says his sort of prearranged greeting. And then you get handed off to other people because it takes Stephen a long time to, you know, to make the words. It, it, it's very slow working with his computer. So I turned him down. Stephen Hawking. I said no. And, and it's an interesting thing because at that time, ending grad school, remarkably, I was a hot property on the job market. And the real reason why I was a hot property is because nothing interesting was happening in physics at the time. <laughs> and you could be a hot property just on the basis of promise, not on the basis of any accomplishment. So I was getting job offers right and left. I had convinced people that I had promise. And ultimately, where I decided to go was to MIT. Alan Guth was there, of course. You would want to go to MIT. And I had already started working with Alan, and I knew lots of people there. To be very honest, in retrospect, I think the choice was, at least in some measure, the safe one. I knew what was going on at MIT. I knew the people there. I wasn't quite sure that I was ready to go to the bigger pond and work with Stephen Hawking or anything like that. But it's only a postdoc job. It lasts three years. Three years later, I'm on the job market again. Stephen Hawking once again offered me a job. No phone call this time. It was email at this point. Uh, and uh, here, uh, something interesting happened because I was no longer a hot property on the job market. Things had changed. There were interesting things going on in cosmology, and I was not part of them. It turns out that if you want to remain a hot property on the job market, you have to really do things that are interesting not only to you, but to the rest of the world. <laughs> no one had told me. Uh, but, for, but somehow Stephen Hawking and, and Cambridge wanted to hire me again. Uh, and I got one other really, really attractive job offer at the Institute for Theoretical Physics at UC Santa Barbara. And ultimately, I chose to go to Santa Barbara, and it was in part because this time I felt I was ready. I wanted to challenge myself as much as possible, and Santa Barbara was really the place where the best theoretical physics was going on at that time. And the other good thing is, once I moved to Santa Barbara, I realized Stephen Hawking came to visit all the time. He would come to visit once a year to us in Santa Barbara. So it was only in Santa Barbara where I finally met him in person. He was there with his retinue, his, his posse, his entourage, the grad students and everything. And a whole bunch of us are going to lunch one day. And I was talking to one of Stephen's graduate students, uh, Rafael Busso. And I said, Rafael, you should introduce me to Stephen. I've never actually said hi to him in person. And as a joke, I said, I hope he's not mad at me. I turned him down when he offered me a job. 
And Raphael said, oh, don't worry about that. There's one guy who turned him down twice. (laughs) Yes, that was me, I said. Yep, that was me. And Raphael, his jaw literally dropped. And he ran up to Stephen in the wheelchair. He goes, Stephen, Stephen, this is the guy. This is... This is the cocky son of a bitch who wouldn't come twice. (laughs) Hi, Stephen. Yes, that was my introduction. Stephen Hawking turns out not to care. His research career is going along fine, with or without uh, (laughs) my help. That was the awkward introduction. It wasn't until a year later that I actually got to interact with Stephen Hawking a little bit, because I was given the task, still postdoc in Santa Barbara, pick up Stephen Hawking at the airport. How, what does that mean and how hard can it be? Uh, he, Stephen needs to drive around in a special van that takes his equipment and so forth. And I was, it wasn't even licensed to drive this van. So literally my job was to show up at the airport and point them to the van. When Stephen and the whole entourage appears, there's the van. It took five hours. And it wasn't because, you know, it took a lot of time to get in the van. You know, they were in the van, you know, they're moving slowly. But, but he had a whole agenda in his mind. And I'm not going to tell you the whole agenda. Just to give you a little flavor, uh, at one point, you know, after they had sort of dropped some people off and they wanted me to follow them the whole way, uh, we stopped at a supermarket because they needed to get tea. British, right? They needed their tea. And we spent, I spent half an hour sitting in my car in the parking lot of the supermarket as nurses shuttled back and forth from Stephen Hawking's van to the supermarket because he couldn't decide what kind of tea he wanted. <laughs> and he talks very slowly on the computer. And five hours later, midnight, I finally get home, and I learned something that night. I learned something from Stephen Hawking more than I'd ever learned from his physics papers, as awesome as they are. Stephen Hawking is the most stubborn and ornery person in the world. (laughs) And I honestly think that's why he's alive. He was supposed to die back in the 1970s, but Stephen Hawking does not adapt to what the universe or the world wants from him. He will sit there and think about what kind of tea he wants. He will think about where he wants to go have dinner. He will not compromise. He's going to do things his way, and I think that he just didn't want to die. He's just like, no, I got stuff to do. I can't really be bothered with that right now. <laughs> Meanwhile, life goes on, and soon, it's, it's my third year of being a postdoc in Santa Barbara, and I need to apply for jobs again. And I was, I was sort of the world's expert at a bunch of things that nobody else cared about. This is not a good position to get a faculty job. Um, but fortunately, the universe, like the one time, it came to save me. I love the universe. And when it really mattered, it stepped up. In 1998, we discovered that the universe is accelerating. So when I say this is the royal we, I had nothing to do with it. But the galaxies <laughs> out there in the sky, they're not only moving apart from us, they're moving apart faster and faster, the acceleration of the universe, something we attribute to something called dark energy or the cosmological constant. I was totally an expert in that because the month before it was completely uninteresting. And it turns out I had written papers about the theory of that. I wrote a well-cited review article about that. And my ex-office mate in graduate school was one of the people who discovered it. Brian Schmidt shared the Nobel Prize in 2011 for discovering the acceleration of the universe. But in 1992, he was answering phones for me. I want everyone to know that. So without having done anything at all, I was a hot property on the job market. In fact, this was the one time when I got summoned down to Stephen Hawking's office. Because when he visited Santa Barbara that year, it was just after the announcement, and he wanted to know about this supernovae and the cosmological constant, the acceleration of the universe. So he summoned me down, and I was actually teaching Stephen Hawking physics for that one little moment. And that was great. And I was a hot property on the job market again. I got various different offers. I got an offer which was essentially my dream job at the University of Chicago, where there was a tremendous program in particle physics and cosmology theory. And I I literally remember, you know, being in my office and getting off the phone when the offer had been given to me and putting the receiver down and jumping up and down with excitement that this had happened. And six years later, I was denied tenure by the University of Chicago. The last step that you need to actually succeed there. Yes, hissing, I like that. Uh, 
I still kind of don't know why I was denied tenure at the University of Chicago. You get many different stories that are told to you, and they don't all quite make sense. You know, I'd written papers. They were good papers. They were highly cited. I had the best teaching evaluations in the department. But at least part of it was because it was very clear there were things I liked doing in addition to doing research. I organized conferences. I wrote a textbook in general relativity, the thing whose centenary we're celebrating. And when it comes to giving you tenure, indicating that you like to do research is a negative because you might stop doing research after you get tenure, and that is bad. And, you know, don't worry about me. I am fine. I got a wonderful job at Caltech, which is an even better place uh, to do physics in, moved to Los Angeles. I fell in love. I got married. I bought a convertible. Uh, <laughs> done all sorts of great physics research, written books, and et cetera, and everything is, is my life is very, very good. I, I landed on my feet. But still, but still, I think that not a day has gone by over the last 10 years since I was denied tenure when I haven't thought about the fact that I was denied tenure. It is something that stays with you. It is a very, uh, both a very personal and a very public humiliation and repudiation. You know, you're these people who are your friends and your colleagues who are so enthusiastic about hiring you just a few years ago have now decided you're not that great. And you need to do something else. And partly it was my fault. I knew perfectly well when I was doing these other things, when I was organizing and writing, that these hurt my tenure chances. I didn't know that much that they hurt my tenure chances, but I knew what I was doing, so it, it makes you think a little bit. And what I've done is I've trained myself in these moments... Uh, to ask myself, what would Stephen Hawking say about this? I don't know what he would say. I didn't ask him. I, I, I try to keep uh, our conversations about physics when I get the chance to talk to Stephen. But I like to think he would say, screw those guys. Because Stephen Hawking does things his way more than anything else. He does not compromise. He is stubborn. He's going to do things his way. And I think that Stephen Hawking would say, you know, you have to be who you are in the world may or may not react in the way that you hope, but you don't have control over that. You have control over what you do. And I know that I will never be able to sort of reach the levels of intellectual accomplishment that Stephen Hawking has enjoyed. I hope that I will never be called upon to show the levels of personal courage that he has shown in his life, but I can aim at being as stubborn as he is. <laughs> and I think that this is something that we can all aspire to. Thank you very much. That was Sean Carroll. Sean is a research professor of theoretical physics at the California Institute of Technology. He received his PhD in 1993 from Harvard University. His research focuses on fundamental physics and cosmology, especially issues of dark matter, dark energy, and the origin of the universe. His most recent book is The Particle at the End of the Universe. He frequently consults for film and television and has been featured on shows such as The Colbert Report, Nova, and Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, Ari Daniel, Christine Gentry, and Skylar Bear. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Oberon for hosting the show, to Sung Kim, David Kaiser, Scott Hughes, and Joe Diaz for helping organize the show, and to Time for moving forward. Thanks for listening. Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.